to The Christian Path. I'm Reverend David, and I hope you're well. And as you know, the theme of this ministry is acknowledging that the Holy Bible is the one and only how-to manual for being human. Now, a lot of people can't quite grasp that. They say, I've never heard of the Bible being referred to as a how-to manual. But if you really think about it, that's exactly what the Bible is. We learn from the mistakes of others. And by studying the real experiences of people in the Bible and the outcomes of what they did, both good and bad, then relating them to our lives today is how we grow. It's how we become better Christians. And if you really think about it, that's the reason the Bible exists. The Lord made sure that the Bible was preserved through all these years so that we can study it, learn from it, see what the ancients did back in the Old Testament, see what the more recent ones did in the New Testament, even though it's still 2,000 years ago. People haven't changed. People are people. They were human, and so were we. They had the same desires, the same wants, needs. They did the same things we do today. And you look at the things they did, look at the outcomes of them, and see what happened to them. What pleased the Lord, what didn't please the Lord, the things they did, the things they shouldn't have done. These are all the things we learned from the Bible. That's the reason it exists. And the ultimate goal of the Bible and of us studying it is to follow the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, to become better Christians so that we can all reach our ultimate goal, to enter into God's kingdom. Now, what is this? I'm sure it looks very familiar. Every American knows what these things are. They're bills. They're minted from the U.S. Treasury. It's called money. Now, did you ever notice what people will do for this? I'll give you a good example. Did you ever watch those game shows, some of the TV shows? The reality shows are something totally different. But the game shows... I used to watch some of them, not because I enjoyed watching the game or the challenge of answering certain questions. To me, it was complete entertainment, only watching these people, these educated, otherwise normal people, jumping up and down, screaming, yelling, making complete idiots of themselves on national television because they won money. They either answered a question correctly or they did this right or that right either way it's all about the money they're told now you have this much you won that much you answered this question correctly this is how much money you're going to get or you're going to get a new car or a new boat all material things relating to money but did you ever notice the camera sees all these things. You're watching these people jump up and down like total idiots because of money. They're so elated. They got this euphoria. But did you notice the camera never follows these people backstage when Uncle Sammy is standing there waiting saying, Oh, guess what? You want all this money. Now, this is the amount of money that you owe us for taxes on these things you won. That's never televised. I've heard of cases where people have won a boat, a car. They are so thrilled because they won these things, and then they couldn't keep them because they could not pay the taxes on them. Or they want an enormous amount of money, even going down to the casinos, for example. A person wins all this money. And by the time they pay taxes on it, there's not a whole lot left. Just a fraction of what they actually won. But that, what I'm saying is this. Money is the basis of our entire existence anymore. That's all people think about. That's all that's important. Everything is centered around money. In fact, and this is something that I find really distressing, did you notice that the value of a person is actually based on what they're worth, how much money they have? For example, if you're very wealthy and you have, you're driving a Porsche and you have a half a million dollar home and it's really known that you're successful and you're very rich, watch how people fall all over you. They'll fall at your feet. They'll serve you. They'll do anything. They'll kiss your butt. Why? Because you're rich and they have their hand out, they figure you're going to be throwing money their way as a tip. 
Now, look on the other end of the spectrum. A person who's poor, who doesn't have two nickels to rub together. They barely meet their bills. They're wearing old ratty clothes. Their car is worth about 100 bucks on a good day. How do others treat them? They don't even have time for them. They walk right past them. They won't even look at them. They're not even worthy of acknowledgement because they don't have money. Now, my question here is in this society of cash, of wealth, where that is the most thing that's important to people, where the whole entire society in the world, in fact, is based around money, let's boil it down to one question. Is money everything in the long run? When you look at the big picture, is money everything? Is that what really matters? Is that what gives us our worth as humans and as God's children? That's what we're going to discuss today. Now, people get up in the morning, they take their shower, they have their coffee, have their breakfast, and then they go out to work. They go to a job maybe that they can't stand, people that they don't like, working for bosses that they can't stand the sight of, but they do it every single day, 40 hours a week. Why do they do it? Of course, money. But you know what? Think about this. That's a totally different scenario. Let's face it. We need a certain amount of money to exist. It is a tool, but some people elevate it to make it a god. The people that go to work every morning and they do their job, they go to a job every day, they do what they have to do, they're working eight hours, maybe a little overtime if they can get it just for a few extra bucks. Let's face it, to them, money is a tool. They have to pay their rent, their phone, their electric, plus that nasty habit called eating that we have to do at least three times a week, hungry or not. But let's face it, when you get past that, if you offered these working class people an enormous amount of money, what would they do? Would they just say, well, no, I don't need that. I, money is just a tool, and I just need enough to pay my rent and my expenses. <laughs> of course they wouldn't. They would freak out. They'd jump up and down and say, now I can buy a new car, a new house, a new boat. I can be rich. What money represents is how comfortable we can live in this physical realm. That's all it is. Think about it. The more money you have while you're here, the more comfortable you can be. The more worldly possessions you can have. You can get whatever you want. You don't have to do what you don't want to do. For example, going to a job if you don't want to do it. You can go to work if you want, but you don't have to. You have the freedom. You can have all of these wonderful, high-art, state-of-the-art things because you have the money. Plus, it's a status symbol. Like I mentioned before, people will treat you differently if they know you have money. We mentioned the casinos. Now, did you ever walk into a casino? Try that sometime. Just walk into any casino, say on a Friday night or a Saturday night. What do you see? All these people, the place is mobbed. They're playing on these slot machines. They're rolling dice. They're dealing cards. Why? Because they're all trying to get money. They're hoping that even though they don't have two nickels to rub together, and maybe they're using their electric bill money to gamble with, they're hoping that when they walk out of that casino, they are going to be worth a couple of million dollars, which is going to be totally life-changing. But how often does it happen? More times than not, and you know this as well as I do, those people leave with their head down, their tail between their legs, because the little bit that they went in with, they lost. Maybe they even tapped their Mac machine to get more, thinking, I'm on a roll. Just a couple more spins, and I'm going to come into big money. It doesn't happen. But the ultimate vision of this is, what is their focus? They're there, excited, they're into it trying to make money, trying to become rich, which is the wrong mindset to be in. The Lord said that you can't serve God and money. You will love one and hate the other or despise one and adore the other. You can't have two gods. You can't worship the Lord and worship money. And it's sad to say that when you look around, most people are after money. That is their God. They don't even realize it. But think about it. Anything you put ultimately first in your life, that is your God. And most people are doing that with money. 
Now take a look here at Luke chapter 18, verses 24 and 25, where it says how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a man to walk through the, a, a camel, I'm sorry, to walk through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. What does this mean? What does the Lord mean by that when he says that? It's because a person who is rich puts his money first. He's obsessed with it. That's his first concern. That's his God. So it's easier basically for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven because the rich man doesn't praise the Lord. He doesn't worship and adore the Lord. He doesn't put our Father and our Savior Lord Jesus first. He puts his money first above everything. It is everything to him. But think about this. Is it going to be loyal to him? Is his money going to be there for him when he really needs it as far as something where money can't buy? I'll give you a good example here. Suppose the man is given a sentence where he's told you have this disease and you have three to six months to live. There is nothing any doctor or surgeon in the world can do to save you. What is he going to do? Is his money going to help? Is his money going to give him consolation and comfort? No. And he is going to pass away. And is his money going to go with him? Of course it isn't. It's going to stay here. And other people that didn't even earn it will get it. Relatives, whoever he wills it to, whoever the heirs are, will get all of his money. And they'll just spend it and blow it. Why shouldn't they? They didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. They didn't accumulate it. But the bottom line is, will his money do him any good in the end? It won't. It will stay here and it will disappear. Like Solomon said in Proverbs, money will grow wings as an eagle and fly from you. It is called cold cash. Why is that? Did you ever think that that's just an expression? You know what? It isn't. It is cold. It has no warmth. It doesn't care or doesn't know who owns it, who it belongs to. It's asset, and it has no idea whose asset it is, nor does it care, nor will it be loyal to you. If you make bad investments, if somebody steals it from you, guess what? It's gone. It will not be loyal to you. And gold, silver, platinum, they're metals, precious metals, but they rust. They can be stolen from you, too. They are an investment. Any kind of investment represents money. They will be here when you leave. What I'm saying is this. The treasures that we should be after are the kingdom of the Lord. The Lord has our treasure in heaven waiting for us where no moth can eat it, no one can steal it, it won't rust. That is our true treasure. What the Lord has for us in his kingdom, not the garbage down here on earth. Now you could say, Oh, sure, that's easy for you to say. You've never been there. But you know what? I'm going to share a little personal experience with you where I have been there. We're going to go back a few years, back when I was 19 years old, which is quite a few years. Now, picture this. I was doing very well. I had money out the wazoo. How I got it was secondary. We're not even going to discuss it because it's not that important. It's not relevant to what we're talking about and to what the bottom line is of this story. But I had a beautiful apartment, the finest clothes, jewelry, money. I had girls all around, a sporty car. I had everything and anything that a young guy of 19 years old would want. Can you picture that? Having a life like that, and you know what? Of course, my attitude was there too. I was young, I was cocky, I had the money, I was throwing my weight around, I was the best, I was a playboy, I had all these girls. But you know what? Within a year, something went south on me. I'm not quite sure what happened, whether I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. Something went south. I'll put it this way. Within a year, I wound up living in a 1973 Chevy Vega, hadn't eaten in three days, I was out of work. Where were all my friends? 
where were all these girlfriends who claimed to be so in love with me? You know what? Once the money was gone, so were my friends. So were all of my girlfriends. Everybody abandoned me as soon as the money was gone and everything had gone south on me. Where was everybody? Where was my money? Where was it to bail me out to give me the lifestyle that I was used to? The money had disappeared on me. Like Solomon said, it grew wings and it flew. And without the money, I had nothing. I wound up pretending to be shopping in a supermarket just so I could walk along and eat. I was hungry. It was the middle of winter. I'm in the back of this Chevy Vega with my two dogs, an eighth of a tank of gas. The motor's running. It's 18 degrees out. I'm freezing, thinking, I'm going to die in this car. I'm hungry. I have no gas. It's going to run out. I have no heat. What am I going to do? Where's the money now? Is it going to help me now? No, not at all. But I'll tell you what. It didn't take all that long to pull out of that situation. What do you think got me out of that? Did somebody suddenly say, oh, here's a big chunk of money. Straighten yourself out. Or did my money that somehow disappeared on me suddenly come back to me? No, not at all. Like I said earlier, money has no loyalty. The Lord got me out of all that. I prayed, which I had never done since I was a little kid. And I said, Father, Lord Jesus, help me. I'm going to die here. Whatever I did, I don't know, but help me. The Lord pulled me out of that situation, got me back up where I could live a decent life, helped me find a job. What I'm saying is this. Anything that happens in life, whether it has to deal with money or not, all you have to do is reach out to the Lord. And little did I know that the Lord was there the whole time. I was just too dumb to realize it. Now have a look at Mark 10, 17 through 22, where a man walked up to Lord Jesus and said, good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus say to him? He said, honor your father and your mother, obey the commandments. And what did this man say? He said, Lord, I've done these through my youth. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, there is one thing you lack. You are to give all you own away to the poor so that you are completely impoverished and take up your cross and follow me. The man was very sad and he walked away. Why was that? Because the Lord knew that this man was rich. He had great possessions. He knew that the money meant more to the man than actually following in the footsteps of Lord Jesus. That's why he turned and left sadly. The money was his God. Lord Jesus knew that. He knew the man had all that money. That's why he said it. What would you do? What would anybody do if someone said to them, whatever you have, your house, your car, your money, your boat, anything you happen to own, give it away and have nothing and follow the Lord Jesus. What would they do? Would they actually do it? I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. And even back then, people would not do that. And people today wouldn't do it. So what does that tell us? Everything that I've said before still holds true. It was true back then, and it's true now. People put money first. So what's the bottom line here? We know what money is, the power it holds, and how the society we live in centers everything around it. Money is the center of everything. We know this. We know, as Christians, that money is just a tool. Of course, we know we need a certain amount to pay our bills, to have a roof over our heads, to eat, to live a decent lifestyle. We have to go out to work, to earn the money. We know that it's a necessary tool. The Lord knows that too. But the problem here, like I mentioned before, is the, the society, in fact, the entire world, base everything around money. That is the center of everything. It's become a god because it represents power. It represents things that you can have. 
all of the material items, the beautiful home, the cars, the clothes, the freedom to do what you want when you want. Put it this way, instead of working on Sunday for overtime, you're out on your yacht sailing. Money represents all of these things. We know that. Money has become a god in this society. That's what we as Christians are fighting against. We have to resist that. And you know the enemy, Satan himself, will wave it in front of you. Anything to cause idolatry. And that's what money really does. It's, because it's causing idolatry among humanity. Because people worship money. They'll do anything for it. Look at these celebrities out there. If you want to see something scary, just go on the internet and look up celebrities, the things they do, what they've done. A lot of them actually have sold their soul, literally, to the devil for the fame, the fortune, the money. Now, is that scary? But people do it. They want what they want in this world. But we as Christians have to look beyond this world. Look at the big picture, the kingdom, the Lord's kingdom. We have to keep the Bible, the scriptures, glued to our sides. That, again, is our how-to manual. It's our owner's guide for being human. The Lord provided us with that. And all of these things about money and the evils of it are all right there in the scriptures. Think about it. In today's society, people will kill for it, they'll die for it, and they'll literally sell their souls for it. It's not worth it. Money as a necessary tool is one thing. The Lord knows this. So do we. Money as a God and being put above everything and idolizing money, making it an idol, an article of worship, that is not the way we want to go. What we're trying to do, ultimately, is get into the Lord's kingdom. And how do we do that? By pursuing money? Uh, no, of course not. By pursuing the Lord. What would Jesus do? And how do we know? It's right there in the scriptures. Like I said before, keep the scriptures right there. Read the Bible every day and follow the Lord's footsteps to get into the kingdom. And making money your first goal and your first priority in this life is not the way to do that. Now, what I'm going to say here is, did you ever notice some of these other preachers that they say, uh, give your soul to the Lord, praise the Lord, uh, uh, give your soul and accept the Lord as your Savior and say a prayer along with me. It's not about showmanship. It's a private thing between you and the Lord. So I'm not saying go have, have a big fanfare about giving your soul to the Lord, accepting the Lord as your Savior. It's not a showy thing. When no one is around, when you're by yourself, go into your room, close the door, and get on your knees. Talk to the Lord. He's waiting for you to come and talk to him. Tell him you love him. You want to follow in his footsteps. You accept Lord Jesus as your older brother, your Savior. You want to give your life to him. Ask him to guide you. Become baptized, and then you will become a child of the Lord who receives the Holy Spirit. Because remember, as Christians, the Holy Spirit works with us. Once we're baptized, the Holy Spirit will then work within us. The Lord promises he will send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, which is God's power, as a gift to us when we are baptized and make that commitment. So when you're by yourself, when you're alone, it's just between you and the Lord. Give yourself to Lord Jesus. Tell him you want to follow in his footsteps. He is your Father. Lord Jesus is your Savior. You want to work for them. They are your bosses. I don't care where you work, whether you're a supervisor, a manager, or a warehouse employee. Whoever your boss is, is human. It doesn't matter. It's immaterial. Your ultimate boss is the Lord. Tell him you accept Lord Jesus as your Savior and you want to work for him. You want to do his work. He will send the Spirit to you and he will be with you. Now, if you'd like a copy of this or any other DVD that I've done, all the information is at the end of this DVD on how to reach me. Or if you just would like to reach me or you have questions or you're confused or you just want to talk, 
or you just need reassurance or prayers, don't hesitate to contact me. I will get back to you. I'm here to try to attract as many people to the Lord as the Lord is trying to call. So again, don't hesitate to contact me. May the Lord be with you, walk with you, give you strength, courage, and an incredible amount of faith that, of course, we know we need. I am Reverend David. If you need me, contact me. May the Lord be with you. Thank you for watching The Christian Path. Until next time, goodbye, friends.